is wonderful to be before you this morning as we enter into a dark chapter of Scripture. I did have a joke to open with, uh, but on consultation with uh, my wife and another person who shall remain nameless, uh, it was agreed that uh, it was not uh, going to quite cut it. So if you want uh, to see me afterwards to find out what the joke was uh, that I was going to open with, feel free to do so. But I wonder uh, if you have ever bought something and it turned out to be a complete dud. Probably you were in traffic and you know those graters that they bring along that look like they would be so useful in 17,000 different kitchen situations, then you get it home and you have no idea how it even works. Perhaps that was it. Um, in 2016, a product called the Juicero was released. Uh, it was uh, in the US, uh, $400, and it was to revolutionize the home uh, juicing industry. You could take a pack of pre-cut uh, fruits and vegetables. It would have a QR code scanner on the top to check that they were in date, and then it would, it would juice them for you, which was uh, all very good until people realized you could literally do the same thing just by squeezing them by hand. Um, uh, and it may not surprise you to, to discover that the company uh, one year or so later went out of business. But here's the interesting thing. In our passage today, we see a far worse trade-off. And yet sin has never gone out of business. Sin continues to prosper and prevail wherever human beings are, despite the fact that it offers far more than it can ever deliver on. And in return, it requires for us a cost far greater than $400. So let's uh, turn our attention to Genesis 3. Uh, we'll be covering verses 1 to 13 this morning. Uh, and I'd like to ask us if we're able to, 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 to stand for the reading of God's word. Um, and we will, yeah, you can, you can stand. We'll read the first 13 verses, respond, uh, even as we did last week, pray, and then we'll dive into what the Lord has for us this morning. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the, trees, of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The grass, the flower, but the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's remain standing as we pray. Indeed, Lord, your word endures forever. What a privilege that we have it before us. That we have not just a few spoken words as this couple did to guide their lives, but we have the whole 
counsel of God from Genesis to Revelation. And so as we spend these brief moments looking at how our world and how we ourselves arrived at where we are now, we pray that you would enlighten our eyes, that you would enable us to see your glory through your word, that you would open our very eyes to see wondrous things in your law. And pray that you would use my feeble, weak words in order to convey truth, in order to convey life transforming good news. Not just to the ears, not just to the minds, but to the very hearts of your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we arrive at somewhat of a turning point in the story, in the unfolding story of Genesis, in that so far God has, through Moses, has kind of been addressing the question, and remember, uh, this book is written not to the people that are in it, but to Moses' generation as they... uh, exit Egypt and as they look forward to the hope of inheritance in the promised land. And the first couple of chapters, and especially chapter two, has kind of given shape to what does that hope look like? Because in, um, in Exodus 15, uh, we, we get to realize, you don't need to turn there, but in Exodus 15, um, hoping that I can find it quickly, Yes, in Exodus 15, verse 17, uh, Moses uh, kind of singing a song after the deliverance of his people through the sea. Part of the song includes this. You will bring them in. This is referring to the conquest that will happen uh, in Joshua's day. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. In other words, as as Israel is going back to the land, they're kind of, in some sense, returning to the the Eden from which they uh, had departed. And so chapter 2 in particular gives us some sense, or gives them, in the first place, some sense for what that means, what that looks like. Um, as they are going back to the land. It answers the, the question, how did everything get here? But chapter three begins to answer the question, how did everything get like this? What's going on in this world that God called, ve- excuse me, very good? Chapter three begins to answer that question and as that question is answered, it also begins to answer the question, then what is Israel here for? Why why does she exist? Why has she been called out of the nations? And so as we uh, begin this journey uh, through the rest of the Bible, aside from the two chapters at the start that depict no sin, we uh, should be having those questions in our mind that God is answering through Moses these questions of how did everything get like it is and why the people of Israel Uh, in the first place. Now, our passage today consists basically of three scenes. We'll tackle them in four points, um, and I hope you'll be able to see why. But three scenes. The first scene uh, unfolds a conversation between the serpent. We'll We'll talk about who the serpent is in just a moment. But between the serpent and the woman. She's not yet been called Eve. That's why I'm referring to her as the woman. The serpent and the woman. Then the second scene from verse 6 actually details to us the sin itself and that involves the woman and then we eventually realize that the man has been with her the whole time and then the third scene is when the Lord God shows up and kind of interrogates uh, them if that's the right word Um, and and he interrogates them starting in the reverse order, man and then woman and then the implication, though we didn't get to it in our, uh, we don't get to it in our portion today, the implication is he's next going to turn his attention to the serpent and next week you'll see that's exactly right. So there's kind of this reversal 
The passage begins with the serpent, goes to the woman, then goes to the man, then God shows up, then we go back to the woman, uh, sorry, back to the man, back to the woman, and then back to the serpent, which is kind of a poetic way of showing that everything has just been overturned. Everything has just been overturned. So like I said, we'll tackle it in, fa- in, in, in four points. The first point covers that entire first scene, of verses one to five, and I've titled it, You Can Become Gods. You can become gods. Obviously, that's Satan's, uh, the serpent, excuse me, the serpent's uh, insinuation. It's not the reality. And here I want us to see that sin is rooted in doubting and therefore envying God. Sin is rooted in doubting and therefore envying God. And so the scene opens, chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And we need to ask this question, uh, which I just uh, kind of answered wrongly in something I just said a moment ago. But uh, who is this serpent? And I know some of you right now, you're like, uh, gone into Sunday school mode, it's Satan. That's... Not exactly correct. And, and notice he says that this is a beast of the field. This is, uh, I don't know if I want to say it's a regular one of the animals in the sense that clearly it's not regular because it's talking. And yet it is one of the animals that the Lord God has created. Now, When we get to the New Testament, we do see uh, John in particular, the Apostle John, referring to Satan as that ancient serpent. We do see uh, Jesus referring to uh, some of the Pharisees as children of the devil, which when you compare it with John the Baptist's you brood of vipers kind of also draws some kind of a connection between uh, serpents and Satan. Yet when Paul is explicitly referring to this incident, for example, in 2 Corinthians 11.3, he shies away from saying that this was Satan. He actually refers to the serpent in 2 Corinthians 11.3. In 1 Timothy 2, he's actually silent uh, on who did this uh, tempting, who did this deceiving. And so um, I think the, the, the best conclusion that we can come to is that this is rather like uh, in the, the situation in, in, in Caesarea Philippi, um, uh, Peter has just confessed uh, Christ as Lord. Then, then, then Jesus goes on to talk about how he's going to suffer many things um, and, and including uh, being put to death. And Peter says to him, this shall never happen to you, Lord. Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan, Matthew 16, 23. It's not that Peter has literally turned into Satan, but he is putting forth satanic words. In other words, what I'm saying is the serpent is not himself Satan, but he is acting, if you will, as the first, literally, devil's advocate. Now, the word crafty is also one we need to look at briefly. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now, uh, of course, our translation kind of prejudices us to see this as a negative thing, but the word itself is not necessarily negative. In fact, it's quite ambiguous. It's used um, more often than not in a positive sense. It's used in the book of Proverbs uh, quite a number of times, um, and it's translated, uh, probably if you're using ESV, it's translated prudent. This is a good thing. It's someone who is effective at advancing their own uh, agenda. They're wise in the way that they live out their lives so that their goals are accomplished, which is a great thing if you're submitted to the fear of the Lord. But a terrible, terrible thing if you're not. And so this is not really so much a warning as uh, like a direct warning as something just to put us on our guard to be, to be just very careful, to listen carefully to what this serpent is saying. And just before we listen to what he's saying, uh, it's worth uh, noting that even before opening his mouth, he has already struck a blow at God. How so? He goes not 
to the man who was given this command. More importantly, he doesn't even go to God. Uh, did I say who has given? I meant to say who was given for the man. More importantly, he, he didn't go to God who has given the command. No, he goes to the woman who has it uh, from the man. And so he is completely overturning the social order here because now the creature is going to the woman who is guiding her, her husband so that they together rebel against God, the exact opposite of how things had been designed by God to work. Now his opening words seem somewhat innocent or innocuous. It seems like a, a valid question. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now this is, this is where if we were able to hear the tone of voice in which it was said, it might be easier to discern his, his motives. I, it, it seems to me that it's, it's kind of uh, an incredulous like, really? Like the, the way you might be in a conversation and you say, no, you don't mean she said that. You're joking. That kind, of, that kind of idea coming across. You don't, like, the idea that the serpent wants to convey here is you don't mean to tell me that God is so mean as to have created all of these trees and to have denied you access to any of them. What is he doing? He's shifting focus from what has been freely given to what has been withheld. Shifting focus from the generosity of God to the apparent meanness of God. Notice, unlike throughout the entirety of chapter 2 and the rest of chapter 3, once God shows up on the scene, he doesn't refer to God as the Lord God the covenantal God, the God who is in close relationship with you. No, he just refers to God. Did that dictator over there really say this? Not only so, he also imports this assumption that God's word is subject to to our evaluation, to our approval. We are the ones to decide whether God's word is good or to be disdained. And so in many ways, he is laying traps for the woman. And it bears fruit. Verse two and three, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, you might be wondering, where did I get the idea that this uh, temptation has borne fruit? Well, there is a dilution of God's generosity. We may eat, go back to 2.17, uh, sorry, go back to 2.16, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But in chapter, two verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 2, we may eat, the surely has gone, of the fruit of the trees. The word every has gone. It's like God's generosity has somehow lessened since the question of the serpent. Not only does she seem to dilute his generosity, she dilutes his judgment. Neither shall you touch it, we'll get to that in a moment, lest you die. But in 2.17, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Again, the word surely has vanished. There's a dilution of God's generosity on the one hand. There's a dilution of his judgment on the other side. There's an increased emphasis on the flip side on restriction. Not only shall we not eat of it, we are not even allowed to touch it. Now, we don't know where that corruption came in. Perhaps Adam told her. Perhaps the man told her, uh, you know, we're not supposed to eat it, we're not supposed to touch it. Perhaps that's the way it was. We're not given that scene where he conveys uh, this command to his wife. But somewhere along the way, um, there seems to be this aspect that now front and center of the woman's mind is the idea not of generosity, 
not of freedom to eat of every tree, but of restriction. There's something even more subtle than that. The tree that is in the midst of the garden. That's how she refers to it. Now, if you go back to 2.9, the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There were two trees there some, somehow in the center of the garden, one of which they had free access to. The tree of life, they had free access to that. That's among the every tree of the garden that is given in 2.16. And yet, no longer does she see that as the center of God's grace. But rather, she looks at what God has done, and the center of it all for her is this tree that is withheld. And she also uh, accepts the serpent's terminology by calling God God, rather than the Lord God, rather than Yahweh God. So she has kind of, she's not fully succumbed to the serpent's temptation yet, and yet there are question marks. She has, you might say, given the devil a foothold, and that's all he wants. So he goes in for the kill, verse five, uh, sorry, verse four and five. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now, that could mean you will certainly not die, or it could mean it's not certain that you'll die. Um, Hebrew scholars think it's more likely that it's the latter. It's not certain that you'll die. He's not saying you will certainly not die. You will certainly not face any consequences of your sin. But he's saying maybe you'll be able to get away with it. You know, if you're, if you're able to reach God in his wisdom, perhaps you'll be able to get away with it. God is being mean. God is being jealous, says the serpent. God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he's just offering these kind of empty threats so that you don't rise up to take your place. So that you don't try to perform the greatest of all coups. In other words, the serpent here is presenting God as, as fearful, as somehow insecure, as someone whose jealousy is provoked by the danger that would be entailed if he allows anyone to attain to his status. Whereas God's jealousy for his own glory is for very different purposes and ultimately works towards our joy if we will find our joy in him because there is none other that can satisfy. That's, what, that's the kind of God that Genesis 1 and 2 has presented. It's presented this vast gulf that can never be crossed, the creator-creature divide. And here is the serpent saying, just one taste of this fruit and you'll be up there. Then you can figure out who will be the master, who will decide what it is that we will do, who will uh, decide what is good and what is evil. Nobody to tell you how to live your life. And notice the interesting thing, nothing that the serpent says is technically untrue, at least from a certain perspective. When you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, Verse 7, then the eyes of both were opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 22, then the Lord said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. You will not surely die? Well, at least from one perspective, they didn't. Now, being sent out from, from Eden is a form of death, just like being sent out of the camp of Israel because of, for example, leprosy is a form of death. But from one perspective, they didn't die. So he is speaking not in full untruths, but in half-truths. Half-truths that carry with them a great load of untruth. The, um, the, the, the Trojan horse 
looks like a gift, looks like the serpent is offering a way to become all that we could ever be, but smuggles in a whole bunch of lies, offers far more than it can deliver, and hides the cost. It's like any good salesman. And here's the thing, we need to pursue contentment. And I don't just mean Christian contentment, contentment within the will of God. I actually mean creaturely contentment. It's true, we should pursue contentment with the will of God, that God has me exactly where he would have me if, I'm, if I trust in him. But there's more than that. We should pursue, we must pursue being content with being this side of the divide, being the creature, not trying to transcend the boundaries that God has put on us, not trying to become omnipresent, that is, present everywhere, as our modern technology would have us do, not trying to transcend our, the limits of our knowledge to become omniscient, as AI would perhaps allow us to think that we can do, not even trying to transcend, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, our need, for example, for rest. But accepting the limitations that come with being a creature and accepting that those are good and accepting that the creature finds its greatest joy when it lives up to its creatorly design. You see, the serpent's tactics have not really changed. If he can get you to open your eyes to the idea of questioning God's word. Now, to be clear, we should always question our own interpretations of God's word, whether they are accurate. But here we're talking about questioning God's actual word in its right understanding. If he can get you to open your mind, to open your mind, quote unquote, to question God's word, to doubt, therefore, the speaker of that word, to think that by giving this command, he is restricting my joy, he is restricting my freedom, then he can get you to seek to cast off the shackles. We'll talk a little bit in a moment about how we can um, combat that. But that's what the temptation is, pure and simple. So the serpent offers them this opportunity, so it would seem, to become gods. And again, notice he doesn't actually ever tell them what to do, or tell her what to do. He's addressing the woman, sorry. He doesn't ever tell her what to do, just all by implication. You see the danger of craftiness. Again, prudence, when it is submitted to the fear of the Lord, a great thing, but craftiness, a deeply dangerous thing. Second point, and this is just from verse 6. So verses 6 to 8 is really the second scene, but I split it into two. I hope you'll see why. So second point, verse 6, we shall become gods. That's the, that's the response of the woman. Oh, this is on offer? All right. So our... Here we see that our doubting and our envying of God manifest themselves in seeking to usurp him. It's not even simply trying to, to get to reach to his throne, but actually to cast him off that throne. They want to become like God so that they can be the gods. And the author begins to do this in a very subtle way. Verse 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good... Now, from, from, if you're just going back into, into, into what we've read so far in Genesis, whose business has it been to see what is good? God. Seven times in chapter one, he saw what he had made, that it was good or that it was very good. And now here, that's a subtle way of Moses showing us that it's already like she's trying to take God's prerogative. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes. Now, that phrase, those phrases should kind of ring a bell. Chapter 2, verse 9. Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. This has nothing 
in terms of its physical characteristics, this, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil has nothing beyond what all of the trees had. Yet they have paled into the background. No longer are they enough for the woman. Why? And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. This desire to become wise, this desire to know good and evil in a way that God has not permitted, this desire, in other words, to overthrow the rule of God and be the ones to decide for themselves what is good and evil, is the motivating factor. It's not about the deliciousness of the fruit. It's not about its beauty. It is simply this, the quest to become like God. And really, when we see it in that light, then it's a question of who will you listen to? Because God has offered a path towards wisdom. Follow my commandments, obey me, and you will gain all your heart's desire. And the serpent has come and shifted the goalposts and offered a different route to wisdom. It's rather like in the book of Proverbs as a whole, and especially at chapter 9, as we saw it for those who were in ABS a, few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. Two pathways offered the woman wisdom, or lady wisdom, and the woman folly. Both of them inviting a way to walk. Only in one house, the dead are there. And in the other, Lady Wisdom teaches all that is needed to become wise. So who will we listen to? The covenant Lord, Yahweh God, who has made them, formed the man from dust, built the woman from one of his bones, who has breathed into them the very breath of life, who has given them the full abundance of this great garden. Or a talking snake. You'd have thought that would have raised alarm bells just in and of itself, right? But no. His poison has been at work from the very fast, and it has been effective. See, whenever we face temptation, it is a fight to heed the right voice, to heed the voice of God. And it needs faith to fight that fight to trust that God is good even though I don't understand why he has commanded this particular command, even though right now I desire not to do it, yet God is good. And if he is the one who has commanded me, then this is the path. I will walk in it. It needs faith to see that. I think that's why there's, there's two alternate versions of the hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the pleasures of sin I resign for thee, all the follies of sin I resign. It's really just a question of perspective. If you see with the eyes of the flesh, it's resigning pleasures. If you see with the eyes of faith, you're resigning follies. But that decision is one that is based on will we trust God's word? The answer, no, at least in our passage for today. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The husband does not get off scot-free in this account. He is absolutely passive, sitting there doing nothing. What was he commanded in chapter 2, verse 15? Work and keep it. Or, to use the more common translations of those words, serve and guard it. That's priestly work. It's work that will be ascribed to the priests in numbers. He is to serve the sanctuary and guard it, and just as uh, this kind of sanctuary garden. And, and just as the priests in numbers were to keep out anything unclean from entering into the holy space of the tabernacle, 
lest it die and lest God's wrath break out. So this man is to guard the garden and keep out anything that is unclean from the presence of God. But no, here comes the archetypal unclean animal, the serpent. Right into the middle of the sanctuary. And is he distressed? Is he taking up arms against it? No, he is just sitting there listening, allowing it to dialogue with his wife. Then when she hands him the fruit, he casually just takes it and eats it. When God comes, God knows who he gave the command to. He comes straight to the man. And when Paul is writing of this incident in Romans 5, he said sin came into the world through one man. In verse 12 and following of Romans 5. I want to just reflect very briefly on that, uh, that whole aspect of sin coming into the world through one man, uh, because I think it's important that we do so and see that from, uh, from, from, from Genesis 3. Um, and the whole idea of that is based on what theologians call Adam being our federal head. Don't worry about that word, federal. It just means that he's our representative, basically. So when he sins, we have sinned. When he is guilty, we are also guilty. And for those of us who live in uh, an increasingly individualistic society, that might sound crazy. But uh, think of, for example, um, the battle between David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. And what does Goliath tell, um, tell the Israelites? Uh, Choose for yourself someone who is willing to fight with me. And verse 9, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. In other words, you have a representative, we have a representative, and whatever happens to our representative, it happens to all of us. If, we're, if, if our representative is defeated, we are all defeated and we will come to you and be your servants. That's the same kind of idea that Paul is saying is going on in Adam. As the first human, we are in that sense in him. He is our representative. And so as he fell into sin or into rebellion, so we have done so. And therefore, when we are born, already before we have done anything, we are already under the guilt of sin. We are born as children of wrath. Each one of us. And as Philo read for us earlier, there is only one solution to that. Which is that there had to be a new man, a new Adam. But God, being rich in love because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. How could we be made alive with Christ but that he first came to do exactly what Adam did except to succeed in it? To face temptation in the garden where he could have turned away from his impending death and yet he embraced it. And because of his act of obedience... Through the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. Again, that's the language of Romans 5. How do we come to be in Christ instead of in Adam? By being born again. We were born into Adam's family. We must be born again into Christ's family as we trust in him. And we'll see a little more of that later. So firstly, we saw... The serpent's offer, you can become gods. Secondly, we saw the couple's response, we shall become gods, but now we see the actual outcome. We see it in two very sad portions. Firstly, verse 7 and 8, we have become less human. The couple see for themselves what has happened. 
As I mentioned earlier, the serpent's promise in one sense comes true. Verse 7, then the eyes of both were opened, but opened to see what? To see their nakedness and to see it as shameful. Immediately, 2.25 is broken. We saw the beauty of 2.25 last week. But immediately, the moment they take of this fruit, it is shattered, never to be fully recovered in this age. Their eyes were opened, and their trust vanished. You see, though they rebelled together against God, rebellion against God always drives apart. Because, we, I, think, I think it's because we kind of know that only one person can really sit on the throne of our lives. So as long as someone else wants to, wants to be competing with us, wants to be on our level, that person is a threat. I'm speaking naturally. Hopefully as Christians we're getting beyond that. But as, just from our natural sinful inclinations, the way we view things is only one person can sit on the throne of, of my life. And therefore this other person is a threat because they've attained to the same level that I've attained to. If they, if they just remain down there, then I could squash them. You see, the very same motivation that the serpent is ascribing to God is the very motivation that becomes that of humanity. And we're wondering if, if, if this person could so easily cast off steadfast love towards God, what happens when it's my turn to be cast off? So there's that fear. They try to cover themselves up before one another. But there's something way more precious even than 225 that has been lost. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God would walk with them. He would walk in this sanctuary. Um, and this, this verb is later going to be used to describe God walking in the tabernacle. Um, in, 30, in Leviticus 30, uh, Leviticus doesn't have 36 chapters. It must be 26. Leviticus 26, 12, the, like, the climactic covenant blessing is that God would walk among his people if they were faithful. And in 3.8, we see that's exactly what he was doing in the garden. Yet, they are running scared. They are not running to greet him. They are not joyfully falling down and worshipping him. But trying to hide themselves among the very trees that God himself made. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and no longer is that cause for joy. No longer is that a cause for celebration, a cause to wonder that they can come before the God of all of creation and have fellowship with him. No. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And you wonder, how did they possibly think that could work? Getting changed behind a window. The God who knows all things, the beginning from the end, they are hiding from him. It's just a mark of the folly of sin and the fear of God that it induces. Because in this age, the presence of God is now a threat to us. God cannot dwell in all the earth in the full sense of his covenant presence because he would destroy the people. So he chooses Israel. He can't dwell with Israel. They're a stiff-necked people. He would destroy them on the way if he even goes up with them. 
And so the tabernacle is built. He can't even pervade the whole of the tabernacle because people are still going to come into his presence in all of their sinful uncleanness. And so he dwells in the most holy place, which can scarcely be accessed only by one human being once a year. And even him having made very careful preparations so that he might come into the presence of God. See how much they lost in this worst deal of all time. Now, of course, we'll see more of that um, next week uh, or the following couple of weeks where we see the judgment that is meted out but already we see the loss of that fellowship and the loss of the sense of joyful anticipation that would have surely been there when they were able to fellowship with God before that. Sin leads to shame before one another and fear before God. That should be something that continually encourages us to seek to turn away from it when we're considering a particular sin, I think, what will this do to my relationship with the Lord? Not that it brings guilt in the sense that all of our sin has been forgiven at the cross for those of us who have trusted in the Lord, and yet it does put a hindrance in that fellowship such that Peter, describing certain sinful tendencies, will say that these can be a hindrance to our prayers. So, we've seen the serpent's insinuation, you can become gods. We've seen the couple's response, we shall become gods. We've seen the reality, we have become less human, but then... The Lord wants to emphasize that to them in the conversation that follows. And so fourthly, you have become less human. This is now the Lord addressing them and enabling them to see exactly what has happening, happened, or at least offering them the opportunity, an opportunity that they don't exactly take wholeheartedly. Here we see that sin, aside from leading to shame and fear, as we saw in the previous point, it tends to avoid confession. Now, when we read verse 9, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? We are not to suppose that God has ceased to be the omniscient, all-knowing God that we see in the rest of Scripture. This is rather more like the, the, the where are you of, of a parent. Play, when, when the child is, is hiding, you can see the curtain moving. You know exactly where the child is, but you say, where are you? Inviting them to come out. I don't think that was God's tone of voice, by the way. Um, but it's kind of an invitation to come out and explain what has happened. It's not that God is seeking information. God does not need to seek seek information. When when a teacher asks a question, then they're usually not asking it for their own benefit. And when the God of the universe asks a question, he is certainly not asking it for his own benefit, as if though he needs to grow in knowledge. This is an invitation. How does the man respond? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Explaining uh, kind of exactly what just happened in verse 8. And so the Lord offers him a second opportunity. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Again, knowing full well the answer to the question. And the man has the audacity to both blame his wife, who he literally just called uh, a very few verses earlier, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and God, who formed him out of dust and gave him this woman, he, he has the audacity to blame both of them in one short sentence. The woman whom you gave me. I have no responsibility here. There's this woman. You are the one who saw that, that I needed her. You gave, you gave her to me. A very first thing she does after you've brought her to me. And, and I even, you know, 
I even spoke very kindly about her. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. I gave her a very nice name that's based on my name. Then what did she do to repay me? The woman you gave me. She gave me the fruit. She gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. No acknowledgement whatsoever that he was sitting there observing this conversation. No acknowledgement that the very sinful inclination that had just entered his own heart was his alone. If he didn't have the guts to deal with the serpent the way he ought to have done, at least he could have declined the fruit. No acknowledgement of any of that. No, the woman whom you gave to me, to be with me, she gave me and I ate. He throws the woman under the bus. And this is, this is not a case where uh, some of some, those of us who are parents know this, uh, parents of more than one uh, know this conversation. This is not a case where you find a fight going on. You ask, what happened here? And they both point at the other one and say, he started it or she started it. This is not such a case. There was no fight going on. The woman was not uh, yet pulled before the court, pulled before the judge. This is God addressing the man and he's like, I don't want to take responsibility. Let me just throw this woman, whom I'm supposed to protect, by the way. Let me just throw her straight under the bus. I don't know whether he thought it worked. I don't know whether when 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 the Lord God now turned to the woman, he felt like ah, that was a close one. I'm I'm not sure, Um, but God is going to come back to him, Um, and in a sense the heaviest statements you could argue lie on him. And certainly when we get to the New Testament, the heaviest statements lie on him. And even, even the excuse that he's brought, sorry, I was about to move on, but I realized I've not said this. Even, even the excuse that he brings further implicates himself. He is supposed to be the one guiding the woman how to live in this garden. He is the one who has given the command. And so when God actually gets to address Adam in 3.17, to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. Now, the application of that is not, men, don't listen to your wives. That's a wrong application, okay? The application is, don't listen to your wife above God. If God has commanded and your wife is saying something different, then don't listen to her. Just to be clear on that, I don't want to be heard to be saying something that I'm not saying. But by him failing to actually lead her in the direction of godliness, he has abdicated his responsibilities. The woman's turn, and this is much shorter, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Keep going down the food chain, God. Keep on moving. And again, God will turn to the serpent first, but he will also return to the woman. Just as the man failed to acknowledge his own part, she fails to acknowledge that it is her own sinful desires that have enticed her and that they have given birth to sin in her. Both of them steadfastly refusing to take the opportunity that God freely offers them of confessing their sins. Some of us know this beautiful Psalm of David, Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. But how do we really enjoy the fullness of that happiness that is put on offer for the man whom God will forgive? Verse 3, um, this is Psalm 32 still. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. This is after he had sinned. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my 
Sorry, I've started at verse 4. I meant to start at verse 3. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The, the opportunity to confess is a blessed opportunity. The failure to take it actually enhances the seriousness of the sin because it implies a distrust of God's grace and it leaves us still wallowing in that sense of guilt. Confession is important uh, for us. Even as Christians, yes, when we trust in Christ, in his finished work at the cross, our sin is fully and finally dealt with. Yes, amen to that. And yet, again, there is a relational component that is not experienced until we confess. I want us to take a little step back now and see what we have basically seen um, in, this, uh, in this act of the drama of Genesis. We have seen that the couple have moved from a place where, as far as we know, and God created them upright, as far as we know, they were living contentedly in the garden, content to be creatures, content that God's will for them was good. And they've moved through drinking in the poisonous words of the serpent. They've moved to become discontent, to think that this is not enough for us. We have a higher station than this, and therefore to seek to become like God, to seek to gain the wisdom that he has, but not by any means that he has put on offer for them to take it to decide for themselves what it will mean for them to live the good life, to seek, if you will, to seize God's blessings, to usurp God, to become the master of their fate, the captain of their soul. You see what was given up in the process of them trying to attain to that? And by the way, those, we call them the the, the incommunicable attributes of God, the things that God can't communicate to the creature, the things that can't be shared by any creature. Man is trying to seize those things, the, th the very things that make God completely distinct from his creation. Man is trying to seize those things. But you see what happens as he does so? He lets go of everything that made him human. He lets go of everything that, that made him to be the image of God. He despises and disdains and turns away from the righteousness that God commanded him to for the sake of seizing after this thing that he can never even attain. If you think about it, it makes more sense to buy the $400 Juicero than it does to sin. And yet, as I mentioned earlier, sin has never gone out of business. The serpent is very crafty. He has always been so, and he will continue to be so as he sows half truths amongst us. As what was given up in the process was inestimably precious. In other words, you cannot even put a number on how precious what they had in the garden was. And they have happily spurned it, happily lost the very image of God that made them who they were, that fitted them to rule over all creation. Small wonder that all creation is groaning until the revealing of the sons of God in their true glory when Christ appears and we shall be like him as he is. This was the worst trade or the worst exchange in history. And yet when we look to the solution, we realize that the solution is found in an apparently equally bad trade. 
as the Son of God exchanges the joy of heaven, the very joy that uh, the man and woman had in the garden, at least to some extent, though, of course, as the Son of God, he has that joy to, to a much greater measure. But as, as he exchanges the joy of heaven for the anguish of a cross, as he does not grasp at, excuse me, at equality with God, he didn't take it as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, not meaning that he ceased to be God, but that he took on humanity, that he became what he never had been until that point took on humanity so that he could bear that humanity, not to the palace, not to redeem us from the throne of the world. No, took that humanity to the very cross where he could die in the place that our sin deserved. As we go about grasping to become God, grasping at becoming what we never can be and losing all that we had in the process. Jesus sees fit to give up all that he had, using the the word give up a bit loosely there, but to give up all that he had to win us back, to lay down his life, not only to lay it down, to take it up again. So that as he dies, we who are in him die with him to those conceited ideas. To the idea that I am more important and therefore I need to strive for this. And as he steps out of the grave, we can live with him in solving others so that we can have this very mind among ourselves, the very mind of Christ, so that we can abandon all of our schemes to rise up and become what we think we deserve to be, what is our due. We can become the least of these so that we may be, be able to bring blessing. to invite us to just take a moment to reflect on what the Lord has spoken through his word to you specifically and we'll pray and and conclude our service. Confess, O Lord, that you are God, and there is no other, that your glory you will share with none, and that this is our greatest good and our greatest joy. Not to try and dethrone you, but simply to be found in you, to be those upon whom you have set your favor in your Son. that he might take the place that we deserved, that he might die outside the camp so that we might be brought in, not just to Eden, but to the new Jerusalem. We thank you that for this, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the very form of a servant, being born in the form of a servant, 
humbled himself to the point even of death on a cross for our sake. I pray that that would humble us. I pray that that would enable us to see what it costs, and therefore to desire to turn away from the sin that has driven us from your presence, the sin that has led us into every folly. I pray that, Lord, we would take up the same mind, that no longer would we strive for great things, but that we would delight in our creatureliness. We would delight in the fact that we are under you, under your authority, under your rule. And we would delight, therefore, not in trying to take the highest place, but taking the place of a servant to show forth the character of the God who has so richly blessed us and who has saved us. Pray that you would help us to this end, that we may die to our sin, to our sinful self-aggrandizement, that we may live to the servanthood of Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.